Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is the fourth reading of the book Vietnam, Why Did We Go from Avril Manhattan, published in 1984. We have seen so far what the book is a little bit about. We have seen some history of the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits previous to the Vietnam War we are actually going to talk about. I started the reading effectually with chapter 16 and 17, that was the last reading that you probably saw. Uh, chapter, 17, uh, chapter 16 was called Catholic Expansionism in Southeast Asia in the 19th century. And then afterwards we had chapter 17, Early History of Catholic Power in Siam and China. And today we are going to read chapter 18, History of Catholic Aggressiveness in Japan. So we are learning more about the history of the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits in Far Asia, much prior to the war time. And with that, afterwards, we will go into chapter 1 and start the book from the beginning. But as I so told you all earlier, I think that with this history lessons in the back, we have a much better understanding of the things we are going to read in the first chapters of the book as Avril Manhattan was pleased to <laughs> give us the book with chapter 1 to the end. So anyway, without any further ado, let's go to history of Catholic, uh, of Catholic aggressiveness in Japan. And by the way, before I even start, I'm going to tell you if you want a little deeper information of what the Jesuits did in Japan, what the Jesuits overcame in Japan, and why, for example, the, in my opinion at least, the atomic bomb was uh, exploded, I don't say dropped, but exploded, in two Japanese cities that has all to do with the Jesuits' history of, the, of Japan. And if you want to read of that, if you want to learn from that, go to the book of Griesinger. Um, he wrote a book in 1866 about uh, the Jesuits and um, their complete history from the beginning of their order up to now. Up to now, that is the time of 1866, of course, when he wrote the book. It is a book in two volumes that I read completely in German, but I didn't read it in English, yeah, because I think reading the same book in English and in German uh, would have been too much in that regard. But you can find that book from uh, Karl Theodor Griesinger on my archive.org and it will, uh, the link to my archive.org, of course, will be found in the description box of this video. So even the English one I have there, and it is called The Jesuits' Complete History of Their Open and Secret Proceedings from the Foundation of the Order to the Present Time. Told to the German people by Theodor Griesinger, 1866. It's volume 1 and 2. So when you want to study more about uh, Catholic aggressiveness, actually, Jesuit history in Japan, go to that book from Griesinger. That, by the way, was used by Eric John Phelps as one of his study books that he used to, um, when, when he put his own book together, Vatican Assassins Wounded in the House of My Friends. You know, uh, When he wrote that, he studied a lot of Jesuit history, also in uh, historical books, like the book of Karl Theodor Griesinger, and he used that one, for example, also. So I can really advise you to read it. I did a German reading of that in about 80 parts, <coughs> and it's very, very interesting. Okay, but now, without any further ado, let's go into the Catholic, um, into the history of Catholic aggressiveness in Japan. In the history of Japan, we have an even more striking instance of Vatican aggressiveness with profound repercussions in the world. As in China and Siam, the basic policy was to see that Catholic merchants and Catholic priests worked together so that both, by extending their own interests, should ultimately extend those of the Catholic Church. This is the maxim of the Jesuits too. Yeah? Ad maiorem Dei Gloria. <laughs> everything to the glory of God. But of course they mean the glory of the God in Rome, so that means of the quote-unquote God in Rome, the little God, the quote-unquote the Pope, the Antichrist, by the way, everything they do to expand his power, because the Pope is the vicar of Satan on earth. 
and Satan wants to rule the whole world. He does that in the flesh through the, pa through, through the papacy, the Pope of Rome. So, when Avro Manhattan says here, as in China and Siam, the basic policy was to see that Catholic merchants and Catholic priests work together so that both Catholic merchants and Catholic priests, by extending their own interests, should ultimately extend those of the Catholic Church. All that these do in this regard, Catholic priests and Catholic merchants, is only to further the agenda of the Roman Catholic Church overall. Yeah? That's what we have to understand from that sentence. Contrary to popular belief, the author continues, when Japan first came into contact with the West, she was eager for the interchange of ideas and commercial commodities. Yeah? We are always told, well, Japan is a close country, they don't like the West, this and that. Well, well, that is based on history, that is based on experience they had. So, contrary to popular belief, when Japan first came into contact with the West, she was eager for the interchange of ideas and commercial commodities. Of course they wanted to trade, because they wanted also to gain money. Because the Bible says, love of money is the root of all evil. So when you come to someone and propose them, when you work with them together, they will prosper from it, of course they agree. <laughs> Especially, <laughs> most certainly then, if they are not Christians, <laughs> and the Japanese aren't, or weren't at that time anyway. Now, from the first chance landing of the Portuguese in Japan, foreign merchants were encouraged to call at Japanese ports. Local potentates Weed, one, uh, weed with one another in opening their provinces to Western merchants. Catholic missionaries were, also, uh, were as welcome as the traders and set about spreading the Catholic faith in the new land. Now, that is something that we spoke about earlier and that we were going to speak about in the future too. When you speak about the Roman Catholic Church, they sent in the trading companies first and along with the trading companies come the priests. So when you invite them to trade with them and to gain from them, everything you will get also is that cancer of the Roman Catholic sun-worshipping diabolical satanic church tradition, history and dogma that you invite along with the merchants. Probably not aware of it, but that's what history teaches us. It has always been that way, and it has also been that way here in Japan. Now, these missionaries found a powerful protector in Nobunaga, the military director of Japan between 1573 and 1582. He was anxious to check the political power of a certain movement of Buddhist soldier priests, but also held a genuine sympathy for the work of the quote-unquote Christians, were newcomers. <laughs> and Christians, in quotation marks, is not what I put here, it is what the author put here. Yeah? So we have to understand, of course, that Catholicism is not Christianity. For the work of the quote-unquote Christians means, of course, for the work of the Catholics, who were newcomers. He encouraged them by granting them the right to propagate their religion without knowing, of course, that it is idolatrous, superstitious, sun-worshipping, satanic religion throughout the empire. He donated them land in Kyoto itself and even promised them a yearly allowance. Thanks to this, in no time the Catholic missions had spread throughout the whole country. Converts were made by the thousands, establishing sizable Catholic centers in various parts of Japan. Had the Catholic missionaries confined themselves exclusively to preaching religious principles, it's likely that Japan would have yielded them tremendous spiritual rewards. But once a Catholic community was established, the juridical, diplomatic, political domination of the Vatican came to the fore. 
as is explicit in her doctrines, the Japanese converts could not remain the subjects only of the Japanese civil authorities. The mere fact that they had entered the Roman Catholic Church made them also the subjects of the Pope. Once their loyalty was transferred outside Japan, automatically they became potentially disloyal to the Japanese civil rulers. Now what we read here of Japan is exactly the same thing that happens in every country that is conquered by the Roman Catholic Church. And especially, of course, I uh, tell you this because I guess there are many American citizens uh, watching these videos and listening to this reading. And if they want to understand that it was exactly the same in the United States of America, they just have to go to my reading of Rulers of Evil. Yeah? So the point is that once the Japanese people were converted to Catholicism, it was not only on the religious realm that they were, uh, that they were uh, converted to, it was also that they were now subjects of the Pope, and by that the Pope was their master. That's with every Roman Catholic that way. So a Roman Catholic, and that is something that you have to understand, a Roman Catholic is in whatever country in this world never loyal to the country or the people in that country, but only to the Pope. That is why your government, if your government is a de jure Roman Catholic government, is not working for the people, but is working for the Pope. And since the Pope is the Antichrist, the vicar of Satan on earth, your government is working for the God of this world, the quote-unquote God of this world, and not Elohim or Jesus Christ. I think there are many people who have never thought that through. This is why the Roman Catholic Church does her policy, which is called convert or die. Whether you are being a subject to the Pope, whether you are being a subject to the Roman Catholic Church, the quote-unquote only church without there is no salvation in this earth, or you're going, to die, you're going to die. They don't want opposition. They erase all the opposition. They do that in Crusades. They do that with the Inquisition, since hundreds of years still doing it, or doing it by war which is the modern Inquisition today, and yeah, <laughs> or they do it via vaccination or whatever use, whatever means they have to use because the means justify the end, or the end justifies the means, that's the way, <laughs> that's the way I have to say it, the end justifies the means, so all means are necessary, are, 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 are good, if the end is good, and if the end is the supremacy of the papacy and of the Roman Catholic Church in the world, then all means to achieve that goal are good. The Japanese didn't know at the time, but the mere fact that they had entered the Catholic Church, whatever Manhattan says here, the mere fact made them also subject of the Pope. Once their loyalty was transferred, outside Japan, so from the emperor, from their own government up to uh, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, they automatically became potentially disloyal to the Japanese civil rulers because, of course, they only adhere to the Pope and not to the people and not to the government of the country they live in. Now, the author continues to say this brought serious dangers to both the internal and the external security of the Japanese Empire. It does so today too. It brings serious dangers to the internal and external security of all countries. You are breeding a fifth column inside your own borders. You invite the cancer into a healthy country once you get the Roman Catholic Church in. And of course, in the beginning, you don't get the church by the church, but you get the church by, you know, trading, like they did here in Japan. It's a very good example of what happens more or less all over the world. 
Anyway, this brought serious dangers to both the internal and the external security of the Japanese Empire. Internally, religious intolerance led to violence against other religions because of the fundamental Catholic tenet that only Catholicism is the true religion. This, of course, meant civil strife. In the external field, Japanese communities, by following the directors of foreign missionaries, had to favor not only the commercial interests of Catholic foreign merchants, but also the political plans of Catholic powers intent on political and military penetration of the Orient. Not many years after the first Catholic missionaries appeared, Japanese civil rulers began to realize that the Catholic Church was not only a religion, but a political power intimately connected with the imperialistic expansion of Catholic countries like Portugal, Spain and other Western nations. Japanese civil rulers began to realize that the Roman Catholic Church came into Japan via the trading like a Trojan horse. The nefarious tenet of Catholicism that only Catholic truth is right and that error must or cannot be tolerated began to produce its fruits in newly discovered Japan. Whenever Catholic converts were made and Catholic communities expanded, Catholic intolerance raised its head. Whenever Japanese Catholics formed the majority, the Buddhists and members of other local faiths suffered. Not only were they boycotted, but their temples were closed and, if not destroyed, were seized and converted into churches. The numerous cases, Bud in numerous cases, Bu sorry, <laughs> butchering the sentence here. In numerous cases, Buddhists were forcibly compelled to become quote unquote Christians, to become Roman Catholics. Their refusal resulting in loss of property and even of life, as I said, convert or die. Faced with such behavior, the tolerant attitude of the Japanese rulers began to change. All of a sudden they understood that they invited the devil into their country. In addition to this internal strife, the political ambition of the imperialistic Catholic nations began to present itself in ways that the tolerant Japanese rulers could no longer ignore. The Vatican, on hearing of the phenomenal success of Catholicism in the distant empire, set in motion its plan for political domination. As its custom was, as its custom still is, it would use the ecclesiastical administration of the Church together with the military power of allied Catholic countries. These were eager to bring the cross, the Pope's sovereignty, profitable commercial treaties and military conquest all in the same galleons. You have to understand this. As its custom was, the author says, it would use the ecclesiastical administration of the church. What is the ecclesiastical administration of the church? It is the hierarchy of the dioceses. It is the introducing of a shadow government in your own government, in your own country. And that's the same as it is today. It works in every country the same way. The Roman Catholic Church has her own hierarchy. and the political powers in the country have to adhere to what the Catholic priests, bishops and cardinals say. They are the real power behind it. The Roman Catholic Church builds a country within a country and the country is then being led politically by the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, the normal people are not, told, uh, are not told this, but that's the way it is. It works in every country the same. And I think a very appropriate example 
for you to understand that is when you look at the L. Smith dinner of 2016. There's a wonderful video out, or wonderful videos out there, uh, even on my channel. On my channel it is called uh, They Are Laughing At You. When you see the political candidates for presidency, in that case it was Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton together with the uh, Archbishop of New York, the quote-unquote Pope of America, Cardinal Edward Egan. I think it was at that time. Egan or Dolan, I always mix those two up. <laughs> uh, one of them was it in 2016. Yeah, He is the real power. And the political candidates are just puppets on his string. And with the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church comes a fifth column, comes a complete shadow government within your country. And that is the same that formed here in Japan. That's exactly what <coughs> the author tells us here, in other words. As its custom was, it would use, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, would use the ecclesiastical administration of the Church together with the military power of allied Catholic countries. These were eager to bring the cross, the Pope's sovereignty, profitable commercial treaties and military conquest all in the same gallants. The Vatican had followed this type of political penetration ever since the discovery of the Americas. Numerous popes, including Antichrist Leo X, yeah, the one who ruled in the time of Martin Luther, beginning of the 16th century, had blessed, encouraged and indeed legalized all the conquests and territorial occupation by Catholic Spain and Portugal in the Far East. Chief among them was Antichrist Alexander VI, with his, great to Spain, uh, with his grant to Spain of all, quote, firm land and islands found or to be found towards India or towards any other part whatsoever, unquote. Japan was included in this papal benediction of Portuguese and Spanish imperialism. You know, when you speak today of the United States of America being the policemen of the world, in the Middle Ages it was Portugal and Spain that had the same role. And you understand the American wars they do for the Pope much better when you understand that what happened, for example, in North and South America to the indigenous people by the Spanish and Portuguese conquerors in the Middle Ages, when you see that that is just the same thing, just in a different time. As the Bible says, nothing new under the sun. When, the author continues, therefore, Japanese Catholic communities became strong enough to support secular Catholic power, the Vatican took the first important tactical step toward its long-range political stranglehold. The coordination of the new Catholic communities in Japan as political instruments. To carry out this policy, in 1579 the Vatican sent one of the ablest Jesuits of his time, Valignani, to organize the Japanese church along those lines. Of course, for a time Valignani's design remained screened behind purely religious activities and received enthusiastic support from numerous powerful Japanese princes such as Omura, Arima, Bungo and others. In their provinces he erected, with their help, colleges, hospitals and seminaries where Japanese youth trained in theology, political literature and science. Once this penetration was deep enough into the religious, educational and social structures of the provinces of these princes, Valignani took his next step and persuaded them to send an official diplomatic mission to the Pope. When the mission returned to Japan in 1590, the situation there had altered drastically. Hideyoshi the new master of Japan had become keenly conscious, conscious of the political implications of Catholicism 
and its allegiance to, distant, uh, to a distant Western religio-political potentate like the Pope. He decided to unite with Buddhism, which owned no political allegiance to any prince outside Japan. Now this is really important, because the author here speaks of what I have spoken in other words already before, earlier. When the mission returned to Japan in 59, the situation there had altered drastically. Hideyoshi, which is the new master of Japan, had become keenly conscious of the political implications of Catholicism and its allegiance to distant Western religion, political potentate like the Pope. He decided to unite with Buddhism, which owned no political allegiance to any prince outside Japan. Not even any political allegiance to any prince within Japan, because Buddhism is not a political power. The Roman Catholic Church is a Roman Catholic, a, a Roman uh, civil power hidden under, ecclesiastic, uh, under the ecclesiastical guide. So they send in the church and tell you it's all about religion, where in fact it is all about politics. Politics and religion go together with the Roman Catholic Church. That's what makes this last beast, this last power on earth, so different from all the other powers. It is a combination of state and church. But you don't see it at first, of course, because, you know, you are blinded by the ecclesiastical teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, especially when you think you are going to learn Christianity, but of course you're not, you're going to learn Roman Catholicism, and you don't see that behind and the back, through the back door, comes the political power. So once established the religious realm, the political realm is already there. It is not something they invite light later, but all of a sudden they put it out in the open. All of a sudden the suppression begins, like we read on the page before, yeah? when it says that uh, Buddhists were uh, Buddhists suffered, um, uh, they were boycotted, the temples were closed, and, dis uh, and if not destroyed, they were seized, and the people were, uh, and, and the temples were converted into churches, and the people were converted into Catholic Catholics, or even. Um, uh, they were uh, persecuted uh, after the motto convert or die yeah? all of a sudden this became clear to the new Japanese leader Hideyoshi and he understood that the only possibility to get rid of that political power is to throw out the religion and then <coughs> he sided up with Buddhism because Buddhism could quote unquote save his people from the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> he didn't understand that even Buddhism cannot save him, but only Jesus Christ can save. But that's another that's another point. He probably did not have a Bible, he probably did not even understand the concept of the Bible or the or the concept of God when you are confronted with a cancer like the Roman Catholic Church, you don't want to have anything to do with quote-unquote Christianity anymore because Roman Catholicism gives, himself, gives itself out for being Christianity. But it's not. It's not. But Hideyoshi here understood it. So in 1587 Hideyoshi visited Kyushu and to his astonishment found that the Catholic community had carried out the most appalling religious persecution. Everywhere he saw the ruins of Buddhist temples and broken Buddhist idols. The Catholics, in fact, had forcibly attempted to make the whole island of Kyushu totally Catholic. In indignation, Hideyoshi condemned the attacks on the Buddhists, the Catholic religious intolerance, their political allegiance to a foreign power, and other real misdemeanors, and gave all foreign Catholics an ultimatum. They had just 20 days to leave Japan. Churches and monasteries were pulled down in Kyoto, and in Osaka, in retaliation for the attacks upon the Buddhists, and troops were sent to 
Kyushu. Now, such measures were such measures <laughs> sorry such measures were only partially successful since the society had been so deeply penetrated the society of japan that is huh? in 1614 all catholic foreign priests were ordered to be deported once more the injunction was precipitated by an even more serious issue. The Catholic missionaries, besides fostering religious intolerance among the Japanese, had begun to fight a most bitter war against each other. Vicious quarrels between the Jesuits and the Franciscans had split the Christian communities themselves. These feuds became so dangerous that the Japanese ruler feared they would lead to civil war. They also saw that civil war would, could mean the military intervention of the Portuguese and Spaniards to protect either the Jesuits or the Franciscans. This involvement of foreign armies could mean the loss of Japan's independence. Was this fear exaggerated? The tremendous expansion of Catholic Portugal and Catholic Spain was there to prove that the danger was a real one. The coming of the Franciscans as special envoys from the already subjugated Philippines in 1593 caused Hideyoshi no end of alarm. The Franciscans ignored the ban on Christian propaganda, meaning Catholic propaganda, constructed churches and convents in Kyoto and Osaka, defying the authority of the state. To complicate matters, they began violent quarrels with the Portuguese Jesuits. What at last made Hideyoshi take energetic measures was a small but very significant incident. In 1596, a Spanish galleon, the San Felipe, was shipwrecked of the providence, uh, of, the providence of Tosa. Hideyoshi ordered the ship and its goods confiscated. The angry Spanish captain, wishing to impress or intimidate the Japanese officials, indulged in some boasting how Spain had acquired a great world empire. For proof, the captain showed the Japanese officials a map of all the great Spanish dominions. His astonished hearers asked, how it had been possible for a nation to subjugate so many lands. The Spanish captain boasted that the Japanese would never be able to imitate Spain, simply because they had no Catholic missionaries. He confirmed that all Spanish dominions had been acquired by first sending in missionaries to convert their people, then the Spanish troops to coordinate the final conquest. And of course the missionaries came behind the traders. When this conversation was reported, Hideyoshi's anger knew no bounds. His suspicions about the use of missionaries, of missionaries as a first stepping stone for conquest was confirmed. He recognized this pattern of cunning conquest at work within his own empire. In 1597, both Franciscans and Dominicans came under the imperial ban. Twenty-six priests were rounded up in Nagasaki and executed and an order expelling all foreign preachers of Christianity was issued. In 1598 Hideyoshi died and Catholic exertions were resumed with renewed vigor until Yashu became ruler of Japan in 1616 and enforced even more sternly his predecessor's expulsion edict. Foreign priests were again ordered to leave Japan and the death penalty was inflicted on Japanese quote-unquote Christians, that means Japanese Catholics, who did not renounce Christianity or, better said, Catholicism. 
This persecution took a more violent turn in 1624 under Jimitsu, who ruled between 1623 and 1651, when all Spanish merchants and missionaries were ordered to be deported immediately. Japanese Catholics were warned not to follow the missionaries abroad and Japanese merchants not to trade any longer with Catholic powers. To make certain that these decrees were respected. All seaworthy ships which could carry more than 2,500 bushels of rice were to be destroyed. The government decided to stamp out Catholicism in Japan. Further edicts in 1633 and 1634 and in 1637 completely prohibited all foreign religion in the Japanese islands. And that is why Japanese people today are very suspicious about Christianity. Because the only Christianity they know is not Christianity, but is Catholicism. Further edicts completely prohibited all foreign religion in the Japanese islands. So that's why you have today this idea that Japan closes in it itself for the foreigners. Of course, because it had experienced Roman Catholicism. And they expelled Roman Catholicism completely in that time from their country. In that time, they returned. <laughs> they always come back. At this point, the author continues to say, Japanese Catholics began to organize themselves for violent resistance. This resistance broke out in the winter of 1637 in Shimbara and on the nearby island of Amakusa. These regions had become wholly Catholic, mostly voluntarily, but some by use of forcible conversion. Eh? Convert or die, I told you. Eh? Confiscate the temples, uh, make, them, make them churches and convert the people by fear of death. Led by their western priests, these Catholic communities began to arm and organize themselves in military fashion to fight against the government. The Japanese government, fearing that these Catholic groups might be used by, Catholic, by Western Catholic governments for the territorial conquest of Japan, taxed them to the point of destitution. The Jesuits, who meanwhile had been preparing for physical resistance, set on foot a Catholic army of 30,000 Japanese with standards bearing the names of Jesus, Maria, means Mary, and Santiago fluttering before them. They marched against the civil and military representatives of the Japanese government, fighting bloody battles along the promontory of Shimbara near the Gulf of Nagasaki. Having murdered the loyal governor of Shimbara, the Catholic army shot itself in his well-constructed fortress and held out successfully against the guns and ships of the Japanese forces. Thereupon the government asked the protestant Dutch to lend them ships large enough to carry the heavy guns needed for bombarding the Catholic fortress. The Dutch consented and the Japanese were able to bombard the citadel only it was finally uh, until sorry uh, to bombard the citadel until it was finally destroyed and practically all the Catholics in it were massacred. The immediate result of the Catholic rebellion was the exclusion edict of 1639, which reads as follows, quote, For the future let none, so long as the sun illuminates the world, presume to sail to Japan, not even in the quality of ambassador, and this declaration is never to be revoked on pain of death. Unquote. The edict included all Westerners with one exception, the Dutch. The Dutch, who had earned their privilege of remaining by aiding the defeat of the Catholic rebellion. Nevertheless, even they were put under extreme restrictions simply because they were also called Christians 
So you see how that Roman Catholic deception to call themselves Christian works? Real Christians are restrained in their work because of the bad experience people have with Catholicism. To the Japanese, anything connected with Christianity had become suspect of deceit, intolerance and conquest. The Dutch themselves had to move their headquarters to the tiny island of Tsushima in Nagasaki Bay. They lived almost as prisoners, permitted to set foot in Japan proper only once a year. Yeah? They lived almost as prisoners, permitted to set foot in Japan proper only once a year. The most forcible restrictions, however, concerned Christianity's religious ceremonies. The Dutch were not permitted to use Christian prayers in the presence of a single Japanese subject. The Japanese had become so incensed with anything which even reminded them of Christianity that the Dutch were forbidden to use the Western calendar in their business documents because it referred to Christ. By now Christianity represented in their eyes nothing but the torturous Western device for political and military domination. <sighs> This is such an important part we are reading of this book here. If the whole world would come to the understanding that the Japanese had here in the 17th century, the world would be a better place. If all the world understood finally that Roman Catholicism is only a disguise for political usurpation, for political power of a one-man authority, uh, one authority government, a dictatorship, because that's what it is. The Pope in Rome is the only real, true king that still exists in this world. An absolute king. It is an absolute kingdom. It is an absolute authoritative government. And the Roman Catholic Church disguises itself under the mantle of Christianity to force that power all over the countries. And Japan in the 17th and the 16th and 17th century, they got it. Bravo, Japan! Of course, in a later moment, in a later moment, they fell again for the Jesuits. That's why the world is today as it is. Of course, Japan could not exclude itself from everything else. So the Jesuits got a hold in, in Japan again, like today. But, but the point, and, and I don't venerate Japan. Don't get me wrong. They were heathen. They were sun worshippers too. That's something they had in common, of course, with the Roman Catholic Church. They also had a superstitious or have a superstitious and idolatrous religion. That's not the point. But the point is that they at least saw that how Roman Catholicism uses its religious realm for political power. And if every country would see that, or if every country did see that in the world now, the world could be a better place. Because the people finally understood that Roman Catholicism A is not Christianity and B is only to usurp the whole country, to suck it out and to implant the authoritative dictatorship of the Pope of Rome instead of their leaders. And as long as they have their leaders, like we in Belgium and do, in Germany do, like you in America do, as long as you have your leaders, the people do not see the real leader behind them. That's the whole story. The Japanese at least got it. They completely understood that the political realm that Roman Catholicism brought along was only a disguise for the authoritative dictatorship being set in power of the Pope. And they didn't want that. They wanted their own government. They wanted to be sovereign, self-ruling, not being ruled by a foreign power like the Pope. The Japanese got it and I congratulate the Japanese for the steps they took. Not for the violence, don't get me wrong. Not for the violence, but for seeing that and understanding that 
and driving the Jesuits and the Dominicans and the Franciscans all out of the country. And they knew nothing could leave could left could be left over because as the Bible says a little leaven spoils the whole lump when you even leave one Catholic in your country you still have the last cancer cell in there and that cancer cell can reproduce and build another swelling really the Japanese really got it here at this moment the Japanese had become so incensed with anything which even reminded them of Christianity that the Dutch were forbidden to use the Western calendar in their business documents because it referred to Christ. So here you can see how the Japanese of course were betrayed to understand Christianity as being Roman Catholicism, which it was not. And of course they maybe would have had a chance if <laughs> they were diligently uh, negotiating with, with the Dutch to see that the Protestant Dutch were also enemies of Roman Catholic uh, of Roman Catholicism but anyway by now Christianity represented in their eyes nothing but the torturous Western device for political and military domination when finally the Dutch signed a trade agreement among its seven points where four connected with Christianity. 1. Commerce between Japan and Holland was to be perpetual. 2. No Dutch ship could carry a Christian of any nationality or convey letters written by Christians. 3. The Dutch should convey to the Japanese governor any information about the spreading of Christianity in foreign lands that might be of interest. And I think that we have to understand here in this regard Christianity also as Catholicism. So using the Dutch as more or less spies here. And last but not least, point four, if the Spaniards or Portuguese seized countries by means of religious machination, such information should be given to the governor of Nagasaki. So they used the Dutch as spies to tell them what's going on in the world and to tell them every movement of the Roman Catholic Church so that Japan could be vigilant. In addition to this, all books belonging to Dutch ships, especially those dealing with religious subjects, had to be sealed in trunks and turned over to the Japanese while the ship was in port. The Dutch who at first were permitted to sail seven ships a year, were later restricted to one. Suspicion of the perversity and cunning of Christians, speaking of course of Catholics, so suspicion of the perversity and cunning of Catholics became so profound that they even strengthened the first edicts by new ones. It became a criminal offense for any Christian ship to seek refuge in a Japanese port or for any Christian sailor to be shipwrecked off the coast of Japan. To all intents and purposes Japan became a sealed land hermetically close to the outside world. It remained sealed about 250 years until Commodore Perry in the middle of the last century speaking of the 19th century opened the gates of the land of the rising sun in unmistakable western fashion by pointing against the recluse nation the yawning mouth of heavy naval guns and here we have to go into footnote number three because the author gives a footnote here and i made a mark on it that it is a interesting footnote so let's see, we are in chapter 18 and it says here, It is strange that America, as late as the beginning of the second half of the last century, meaning the 19th century, was tempted into behaving like the Catholic Church in her dealing with Japan. Suffice to quote the, quote, New York Weekly Tribune, unquote, referring to the Perry mission, quote, In this state of things, going thus into pagan realms, 
it behooves us not to lose opportunity of laboring or for the spiritual benefit of the benighted Japanese. Let not these misguided men fighting for their own perish without the benefit of the clergy. Unquote. And this brings the reading of chapter 18 to the end. And instead of continuing with chapter 19, which is called Creation of Dangerous, a Dangerous Alliance, we of course now go into chapter 1 of the book, which is called Preliminaries, which I read already, but I want to do this once again. And then we go into chapter 2, the Vatican-American Grand Alliance. With, these with this history lesson of the three chapters, chapter 16, 17 and 18, I hope and I pray that you understand that the history that we read about on China, Siam, on Vietnam in the past and on Japan in the past now, you understand the mechanics, uh, uh, not, not the mechanics, uh, you understand the uh, the working of the Roman Catholic Church, you understand how this cancer spreads by first going into with trade, of course, that is so wishful for many people to have trade and to gain money and to get richdom, wealth in their country, and along with the traders come the missionaries, and with the missionaries come the political agenda of the Roman Catholic Church. And in no time after you start trading with new traders, let's call them, that bring along these missionaries, in no time after that you find your country turned around, your people being converted into Catholics, and that means subjects of the Pope who only have an allegiance to the foreign leader, the Pope of Rome, and not the leaders of your country. They have no patriotism for their country, they have only patriotism for Rome where there should be only patriotism for Jesus Christ and the Kingdom of God. But that's another case. The point is, the Roman Catholic Church has stealth-wise used this agenda for centuries and again and again and again with success. Now after all we just read about Japan, after all you understood just of the history of Japan, can you tell me why, from the end of the 19th century on, Japan had opened its borders again? Why don't other countries see the danger of the Roman Catholic Church implanted in their country? Why don't people just read the Bible and understand? After all this reading of the books I did, and the books I'm going to do, and now especially this one, Vietnam, why did we go? Why don't the people of the world understand that Catholicism is not Christianity and that the Pope is the vicar of Satan on earth and the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan? We really have to bring this message out and I hope a few people watching this video, now got it. Now understand how the Roman Catholic Church worked in the past for centuries and that it still works this way. Because the Roman Catholic Church is semper eadem, never changing. Until next time, the fifth reading when we start with chapter 1. Once again, I will repeat that reading and then afterwards going into chapter 2 of Vietnam, why did you go? Thanks for watching, thanks for listening, I hope to see you soon, see you soon, back with the next video and in the meantime, please read your Bible. Maranatha.
hast been favorable unto thy land Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people Thou hast covered all their Thou hast taken away all thy wrong Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people Thou hast come Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again? Thou draw out thine anger to all generations. Wilt thou not revive us again? That thy people may rejoice in thee. Show us thy mercy, O Lord. That thy people may rejoice in thee. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. And grant us thy salvation. And grant us thy salvation. speak peace unto his people and to his saints but let them not turn again to folly surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him that glory
Thy salvation.